Our first scripture lesson today comes to us from Proverbs chapter 16 and verses 1 through 9. Let us hear God's word to us together. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, for the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. But loving kindness and truth iniquity is atoned for, and by the fear of the Lord one keeps away from evil. And when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, and verses 1 through 14. Let us again hear the word of the Lord together. Now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and this steward was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called to him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. And the steward said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the stewardship away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they will receive me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said to him, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. And his master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, will you be entrusted with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things, and they were scoffing at him. Here ends the reading of God's second lesson. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The clever steward, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words that were spoken out of the lips of Jesus. Lord, they are gracious words, and they are full of mercy. Help us, O God, to realize the true meaning of this parable for our own lives and for the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ, our Lord. For we pray in his name. Amen. The Baltimore Orioles of 1894 through 1896 was the best team of baseball that it had ever seen up to that time. But they were also the craftiest. 
One of Baltimore's favorite tricks was to plant a few extra baseballs in strategic spots out in the outfield grasses. They were very tall back then, and that was well before the carefully well-maintained manicured lawn that we have today in baseball fields. So any balls that were hit in those tall grasses looked as if they might go for extra bases, and suddenly they'd be miraculously held to singles. One day, however, an opposing batter drove a ball out to left center field where one of the balls that they had placed out in the outfield had been hidden. The left fielder picked up the hidden ball and threw it in. But the center fielder, not seeing what his teammate had done, picked up the hit ball and threw it in. The umpire, seeing two balls coming in to second base, called time and then awarded the game, the entire game, to the visiting team by forfeit. The Baltimore Oreos had broken the rules of baseball, and they had to face the consequences. They lost the game. They had devised a very clever way of cheating, but they hadn't planned ahead well enough to consider what would happen if they were ever caught. Their reputation was severely tarnished in the minds of their fans, and they lost all respect, and yet baseball fans everywhere had to admit one thing. Their plan was pretty clever. Jesus told a parable about a clever steward who was untrustworthy, who had been found guilty of breaking the rules and guilty of probably malfeasance, and yet we need to understand the duties and dynamics of the Middle Eastern steward of Jesus' day before we can really take this parable apart and fully understand it. Stewards of Jesus' day were generally unmarried men or widowers with some education and business training, but they seldom possessed the uh, ability to make their own money. Their rich employers hired them so that they could earn money for their employer. They had no families, these stewards, and no one else to support them, and no one else that they needed to support, so they simply lived on their master's wealth, and they had a symbiotic relationship, if you will. Whatever money was earned by the master also helped their lives in a better way. They lived better lives as a result of it. But they weren't merely servants because they had complete freedom and the, they had the authority over the master's household and all the master's goods. These were trusted stewards who had charge over the other servants, over the household, and sometimes even over the wife and children when the master was away. Now, the common hired servants of wealthy people regularly became jealous of these trusted authoritarian stewards. And they would start rumors about them, and they would constantly conspire against them, trying to ruin their reputation. And obviously, these trusted stewards had to be trustworthy, or they'd be fired, they'd be released from duty. So Jesus tells this parable about a steward who was accused of squandering his master's possessions, a very familiar sounding story of his day. Now, we're not really sure if he was guilty. Jesus never really says that. The master says, in fact, what is this I hear? So it could have been a rumor started by the other servants. We don't know. But let's assume for a moment that he was guilty. He may have spent too much money on extravagant shopping sprees, or he may have lent too much money to those who didn't pay him back. He may have wasted the treasures that his master had entrusted to him. And finally, the boss said, enough is enough. Show me the books. Turn in your books and your checks, so to speak, and charge cards. You can no longer be steward of all that I've given to you. I wonder how long God patiently waits for us as his stewards, we've been given so much of his, to give back to him and to serve him 
and use the time and opportunities we've been given all for his glory. Will he sometime take away our stewardship? All of us will eventually lose our stewardship, even if we've been totally faithful, because should the master tarry, none of us will remain here forever or be his earthly stewards forever. I just pray that I never have to hear my Lord say to me, give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be trusted to be my steward. So from Genesis onward, we hear that we really don't own anything. You and I simply borrow everything for a limited time. It's entrusted to our care. We are entrusted with this earth and everything in creation. And therefore, it is wisdom that informs us that our stewardship will one day be taken away from us and the master's books will be opened. And even if we've been faithful, our stewardship is going to be examined. So this unrighteous steward was a very clever guy. He figured out how to gain support from a community and come out okay. How did he do it? Well, right before the news circulated about how his master was taking away his stewardship officially, this guy went to everyone who owed his master something, and he told each debtor to make out the bill to be less than what he owed, thereby ensuring that they were very happy with him, and he might even have support to stay in one of their homes, and he would have a place to live even after the master put him out of his house. And Jesus concluded by saying that the master praised the unrighteous steward because he was so clever. This unusual ending, though, makes this parable among the most difficult of all Jesus' parables to interpret. What does this have to do with God's kingdom? Well, in the game of chess, you have to think about every move you make or you'll find yourself checkmated by your opponent, right? And it is smarter to give up a pawn in order to keep a knight or to give up a bishop, perhaps, in order to save a queen. You have to be clever to be a good chess player. You have to think way ahead to be able to see what is coming and prepare for it. In the same way, if you knew your employer had just lost a major contract, you might begin to prepare yourself for a layoff. You should take some action, maybe even seek employment elsewhere if your employer, certainly if your employer told you you've only got a few more weeks or days on the job, like he was told. And what else could this steward do for a living? He didn't really know how to do anything else. And since he didn't have a feathered nest egg for himself, in other words, he didn't open a personal account for himself and, and he didn't take a lot of money from the master. Otherwise, he would have been very wealthy and not had to worry about where he was going to live. So he must not have taken too much of the master's money. He was just too extravagant with its spending. And so he reasoned he wasn't strong enough to do manual labor and he was too proud to beg. And then it hit him. How do I handle this? I know how I'm going to handle this. He called all the master's debtors together and he forgave each one of them some of their debts. Perhaps just the part, like I said, which he would have benefited from. He probably got a cut of every one of those debts. How much do you owe my master? 100? Write down 50. He knew that each one of his master's debtors would be more apt to take care of him once he got put out on the street, and they might even get him a job as a steward in their house or someone else's home. So here is a clever man. Here is someone who has planned for what is coming. Here is a realist who knew his goose was cooked, and even if he was innocent, he took measures towards his future. Now, what would his master say when he discovered that his steward had forgiven others so much of their debt, they actually 
uh, had owed the master and not him, uh, perhaps the master would have been upset or perhaps he would have said, wait a minute, that was his cut anyway. I didn't really lose anything. It was wrong what he did, but he did it because he was very, very clever. So you would assume that this rich master lord would have been even more angry at his steward for forgiving those who had owed him money. But when he realized why he had forgiven so much debt, he praised the unrighteous steward, at least for his cleverness. But here is where most of the interpretations of the parable get into trouble. The master was not praising him for his cheating. He was not praising him for his misuse or overuse, uh, overspending of his funds. He was not praising him for his bribery, but simply to admit the guy had his escape well planned. It's the same respect a crime investigator may have for a notorious criminal. It's the same respect you might have reading a mystery or a crime cover-up novel of some kind. It's not at all that you want to endorse the crime, but their methods can be so very ingenious. And one must give credit where credit is due. Now, you may have heard some explanations of this parable in relation to God's kingdom. And what in the world does this mean? Or what in heaven does it mean? Many of the interpretations seem unable to answer the main question or the primary point of the parable. Even some of the greatest theologians were not quite sure how to interpret it. Several books I've read just give up on the primary message altogether and declare that it must not have been uh, recorded the way Jesus had intended it. And we can become so encumbered by the ethics of this parable that we do miss the main focus of it. So in order to truly understand this parable, we must remember what has been leading up to it when Jesus tells the parable. Jesus had consistently provoked the rage of his critics, the Pharisees and Sadducees, by freely forgiving the sins of those who came to him, right? He also healed sinners. In fact, he healed sinners, uh, the Pharisees believed, deserved their uh, sickness or blindness or lameness or whatever it was. In fact, Matthew 9 recalls that his critics didn't mind his healings as much as they were angered by his daring claim to be able to forgive sins. As they said in Mark 2, 7, why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So essentially, Jesus made friends of sinners. You've talked and heard of Jesus as being a friend of sinners by forgiving them their debts. Do you hear the parallel now in this parable? The story of the rogue manager is most likely a picture of Jesus. And the way the Pharisees believed, he totally mismanaged the role of being a rabbi, a teacher, in their minds, in the minds of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus was not doing it right the way they did it. In other words, they wanted him to judge others, condemn others, and Jesus didn't do that. So they thought of him as a rogue steward, a rogue rabbi. You heard me right. In their minds, Jesus mismanaged the rabbinic responsibility to mediate God's justice and judgment against others and carefully meted out forgiveness instead. And that was only after the evidence of faith as we see in the scriptures. But I believe that this steward's behavior is actually a description of the outrageous divine generosity squandered upon us all. How much do you owe God? Sit down and write down 50 if you owe 100. In other words, you're forgiven. And not just the percentage, but the whole amount. The Pharisees 
Consider Jesus an unrighteous person because he went around making friends with the worst debtors who owed God a great debt. So Jesus is using this parable to help us understand that he is forgiving others and he's actually a good steward and he wasn't really guilty of anything, of anything doing wrong against the master. He was received into their homes all the time. He constantly fellowshiped with sinners. And so Jesus told the disciples in front of the Pharisees, I say to you, make friends for yourselves. This is, this is where it makes sense now. I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. That when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. In other words, make friends of those that you forgive. Even if, that, even if you think that's unrighteous, that you might be received in heaven. The wealth of unrighteousness, in verse 9, is a phrase that uses the word wealth, but it becomes an adjective for the noun unrighteousness. It really says the abundance of unrighteousness. And it is worlds apart from the phrase unrighteous wealth that Jesus uses in verse 11. In fact, he's really flipping the meaning here. It's like someone saying that he had a wealth of honor versus saying that someone was honorably wealthy. They're not even on the same topic, you see. So Jesus was now on the topic of his wealth of unrighteousness, rabbinic behavior to forgive others their debts and cancel out what someone owes God. While the Pharisees were much more concerned with unrighteous wealth, actual money, and judgment, wanting to condemn, for instance, the woman caught in adultery. You see, all people are debtors, and we owe the master so very, very much. But not all of us are repentant, and not all are forgiving of others and their debts. Many will say the Lord's Prayer and claim to be Christian. But we say these words that Jesus taught us to say, that he might forgive us, the Father might forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Only a few may practice that. And that may seem unrighteous to forgive someone their debts that they owe us. But that's what the unrighteous steward did. Do people really believe that they can have their own sins forgiven and not write off any of the debts of those who owe them? This is all wrapped up in this parable, you see. It isn't wrong to be shrewd, therefore, about our eternal life. We need to be shrewd about it. As Jesus sent out his disciples, he said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd. He told his disciples to be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Be shrewd, but don't do anything sinful. Or as he said here, the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. The Pharisees was the, were the sons of this age, and they were cunning and clever and evil people. But the sons of light can be so naive and so dumb like lambs led to slaughter. I am constantly amazed at the sly tactics of the business world, sometimes even the church. And I'm amazed at the scams and the get-rich-quick schemes and the false advertising and the lies of politicians. And I personally, myself, I've been swindled out of thousands of dollars because I trusted in someone. I'm constantly amazed at the shrewd arguments of national church conventions and general assemblies. And I... And I wonder, whenever I do hear these clever earthly arguments instead of 
the revelation of the scriptures, I wonder, where are all the sons and daughters of light in this discussion? And why aren't they bringing God's word into the debate? Oh, someday we will be eternally glad if we are found to be honest and faithful in our stewardship of God's greatest treasure of all, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we are faithful in small things of wealth and the uh, things of this earth, then the real treasure of the gospel will be entrusted to us. That's what it means. The love and forgiveness of Christ will be entrusted to us. And are we more worried about unrighteous wealth, unrighteous riches, than the true riches of God's forgiveness? One day there will be a different pastor standing in this pulpit. And there will be different people listening in the pews. You and I will live to see that day when we can no longer be stewards in this life of all God's blessings, his forgiveness, his love, his truth, his bountiful riches. So have you been wise enough to prepare for that day when your stewardship will be taken away from you? Therefore, in the meantime, well before our stewardship is taken away from us, let us go out, cancel the debts that others owe you, and at the same time, remind them of the great debts we all owe God. Let us make friends, even through the lawlessness of God's forgiveness and grace and mercy and love and canceling out the debts of our debtors. We will befriend all debtors, and God will receive us at last into eternal homes in his kingdom. For Christ, who was rumored to be unrighteous, right? Rumored to be unrighteous, was the only completely righteous person and faithful steward of the master creator of the universe, God the Father. To God be all the praise and glory. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for the stewardship you've entrusted us with in this life. May we go out and cancel the debts of others and remind everyone of the great debts we all owe God and Lord, help us to turn to Jesus, who was rumored to be unrighteous, but who is the only righteous steward of your love and mercy and grace and truth. But we pray this prayer in his precious and holy name. Amen.